Good morning. It's Thursday morning and time for our devotions. Oh, excuse me. It's not that early. I've been up a while. Anyway, um, our reading today is going to come from Ephesians, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, if you do have the book, uh, A Guide to Prayer for Ministers and Other Servants, um, you will note that um, and and I am uh, I am a week uh, behind, so you may have already you know noticed that. But what I'm going to do the uh, uh, the reading is called for Ephesians chapter two, and because of the way that uh, we do this, or because of the way I do this anyway, um, I, I'm going to break that up into two sections, and so tomorrow I'm going to be finishing up. So we're going to do first part of Ephesians 2 today, and then we'll look at the second part of Ephesians 2 tomorrow. But uh, let's go ahead and get rolling in that, and I invite you to join with me in the invocation. Almighty God, from whom every good prayer comes, and who pours out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication, deliver us when we draw close to you, from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, again, we're going to be <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 10. I don't know why I'm having trouble today, but I am. Hmm. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, even uh, mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come <clears throat> he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, great, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. This is a, a wonderful passage and uh, and it ought to be at one point uh, our cause for rejoicing in our life and in every respect, and it also should be uh, an evangelical um, it should give us all a very evangelical orientation because what is being said here, we know in our hearts to be true, don't we? What's being said here very clearly is that we have all been lost in our lives to sin. We, we see that <clears throat> as a biblical um, you know, uh, theme throughout all of the Old Testament, really in all of the New Testament, that uh, <clears throat> you know, we started out in this relationship with God, and then we threw that away, via sin, and uh, and since we have all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, therefore, on our own initiative, there is nothing that we can do to make that right. You know, God sets up in the Old Testament, he sets up a, uh, a series of different kinds of offerings for any of a various number of sins. Some were very specific to the sin, some were general offerings, um, but the bottom line for a sin offering was that it had to involve blood. Why? Because, as uh, you know, as God said, if uh, if you if you do this, you will die. 
And so a life, it was the sacrifice of a life. It was, it was less about God wanting bloodshed, for heaven's sake, than it was about God wanting us to understand how critical sin was. It destroys life. Now, uh, that's Jamie interpreting that, okay, but um, I really think it's it's so abundantly clear that uh, I think I, that I feel comfortable saying that. You know, there is a price to be paid for sin, and that, and that price is a life. Hence, when Jesus comes, he becomes the ultimate sacrifice, not one that we make in our imperfection, but one which God himself makes in his perfection. That's, the, that's the, uh, one of the, the great and wonderful joys of being a Christian is knowing the forgiveness of God, which he desired for us at such a level. Okay, so this is God's idea. This was God's plan from the beginning. This is what God wants for us. This is what God wants in us. So it's God's plan from the beginning. And he loved us so much that he knew we could not do a sufficient job of correcting ourselves. No matter what the rules were, no matter how clear they were, no matter any of that, God knew we could not do it ourselves. And therefore, he is the one who made the sacrifice on his part. And it cost him dearly. So when, you know, when the passage here says at least two different places, you know, it is by, essentially, it is by grace you've been saved. God's grace, God's gift, God's promise, God's hope, God, you know, it, it, God bringing that into our lives uh, because of his gracious love for us. Make no mistake, God loves you. Make no mistake, God loves a person who really ticked you off yesterday. God loves the person who uh, you can't stand. He may not like what they do, and he may not like what I do every moment of my life, but he loves us. He looks beyond the sin, even though that sin is so enveloping that it will suffocate you eventually. You know, the, the reality is that sin leads to death. We, we just talked about the uh, woman caught in adultery. And, uh, and it's very, uh, it's very clear, you know, that Jesus isn't disagreeing with the law or she was caught in, in a particular sin, the punishment of which was death. And he doesn't tell him, no, you can't kill her, but he does say, um, anybody who hasn't ever sinned can go ahead and throw the first stone. And then they realize that indeed none of them are, uh, valid possibilities for throwing the first stone because of course they've all sinned and and so you know the the the, the reality is that sin destroys us from the get-go we're enveloped in sin the nature of our human condition and uh, and it is only through God's grace that we come out of that condition and have hope otherwise it's just death and so we, uh, you know, of course we're going to die short of the Lord's return, which quite frankly, I think is coming closer and closer. I would be right whether I'm talking about, you know, next week or uh, a thousand years down the road, uh, the, come, the return of Christ is getting closer and closer, right? But I personally think um, we are closing in. I don't think it's going to be a thousand years down the road. And, uh, and so... Anyway, short of his return within our lifetime, we are all going to die physically. But I think that's, uh, you know, one of the things that's really critical to note in that is, uh, you know, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there is an element in which we look at it, and though the body may die, the part that makes us who we are, our soul, our spirit, uh, is going to continue on in Christ until a day of resurrection where we will be rejoined with our with a body that is perfect. Um, I remember as a kid sitting around the dining room table, and I, I don't know what the passage of scripture was for that Sunday's message, but we were talking about the, talking about the sermon. Uh, I, I didn't do that every week, okay? 
So it's not like I was, uh, I was just a little kid at the time, but it's not like we were the perfect family that sat around talking about the, the sermon and, you know, and, and applying it to our lives at the age of five kind of thing. But I, you know, I always was uh, uh, one of those, uh, uh, one of those little boys who shopped in the Husky department and uh, used to offend me deeply because I thought, why don't they just say, uh, you know, it's a store for fat little kids. But they didn't. They didn't. had a husky department, and uh, and so as we were talking about, uh, you know, we would be given new bodies, and I remember saying, "I just hope mine's a little thinner than this one," you know, and uh, <clears throat> and we all laughed and everything. But uh, the point is, we will be given perfect bodies to go with our perfected souls, which will never experience death. The body may die, but the part that makes us who we really are goes to be with the Lord if we die in Christ. And, and so, as I said before, you know, the passage here describes that reality, but it also, you know, it also points out it is not, it's not through your works that you're going to get there. It is through the grace of God. It is through God's love. It's through God's compassion. It is through God's work. All we have to do is receive that acknowledge it, uh, you know, and uh, claim it and receive it and walk in newness of life. And if, you know, if you really had a perception of God walking beside you, wouldn't your life look different than it typically does? And God understands that we are not yet perfected. And so he walks with us and, uh, and his grace gets us through the rough spots. As I said, it seems to me that um, that level of forgiveness that we have received, both from, I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a stay of execution. It is, you know, you're on, you're on death row. That's what this passage is like saying. It's like you live on death row. And then all of a sudden, God shows up, uh, unlocks the cell, pulls you out, carries you to safety, and declares you, not just uh, that you have been uh, set free, but that you are, in fact, innocent. By virtue of the fact that he is the judge, he is also your, uh, your lawyer, and, uh, <clears throat> and the whole thing together, and it's trial by judge, not trial by jury. The whole thing together says you're innocent. And even though we know that we aren't, the reality is God makes us innocent in his eyes. And those are the only eyes ultimately that, that really make a difference. So as I said, this ought to create within each of us a spirit of evangelism. Wouldn't you like other people to know this truth? Wouldn't you like some other people to change? Yeah. And, uh, and so it is, it is God who does that, again, within us. God changes us as we allow it. We have to allow it. But God is the one who does the change. Again, by his grace you are saved. And what is our part in it? Faith. By grace you have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, this, this uh, first part is this, is this celebration of, and, and a real naming of the details of where our forgiveness has come from. And an assertion that we have it indeed been set free. That we have been declared innocent by God. And that we live new lives. If you're, if you're tired of the life you're living at some level, God has new life for you. If you're in Christ... Um, God has new life for you. It's, you know, it is that continual, um, well, I guess the computer representation would be the upgrades, you know. It's a continual upgrade of your life by virtue of God's presence and his grace and his love and his forgiveness. So that initial forgiveness leads to an openness and further forgiveness and uh and God brings glory unto himself by lifting us up. So as you think about that today, um, you know, you might want to say with me, uh, you know, this, this great 
verse from Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 8. For by grace I have been saved through faith. Let's try that. By grace I have been saved through faith. Say it out loud one more time. By grace I have been saved through faith. And this is not my own doing. Okay, say that with me. And this is not my own doing. It is the gift of God. If you uh, if you're having trouble, uh, if you have your short term memory is not working all that great, mine might not. I've got it right in front of me. So get it in front of you, Ephesians two eight, and remind yourself consistently. You know, that it is God's grace. And when we fail, his grace is sufficient to reestablish that journey with us toward perfection. So keep those things in mind. Let them, let them be at the forefront of your thoughts today. And so find, um, so find the grace of God and so find the love of God and so find the, the hope that comes through all that that you might truly be a representative of Christ in the lives of others. Uh, may it be so in your life today. And so, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Have a great day. We'll finish up uh, the second chapter of Ephesians tomorrow.